Hello, everyone. I am Chao Chuan. Today, let's talk about Samuel the Alamosaurus. Alamosaurus is a famously known titanosaur from the late Cretaceous. Titanosaurs can lay claim to being the morphological peak of the entire dinosaur family. Beginning in the early Cretaceous, around 100 million years ago, this group of dinosaurs began to flourish. Many familiar colossal dinosaurs come from this group, such as Argentinosaurus, Pertosaurus, and Notocolossus, including the Chinese Ruyangosaurus and Huanha Titan Ruyangensis, which are only known to the public in recent years. All the gigantic dinosaurs you can imagine generally come from this group. The overall body build of Alamosaurus can very well show the typical features of Titanosaurs. It had a super long neck, and its neck was thick, much thicker than early dinosaurs like Diplodocus or Brachiosaurus. Its body was quite strong. If looking at it from the top, you will see its torso is almost round. If looking at it from the front, you can see that its torso is rotund. When its fossils were discovered, its ribs were all very long. Some rib fossils were crushed into several pieces or were pressed straight due to geological changes. But judging from the length, its ribs should have been in a large arc when alive, so we can tell that the body cavity of this dinosaur was huge. Alamosaurus lived at the end of the dinosaur age, the same period as Tyrannosaurus rex. They also lived in the same place, so the two dinosaurs sometimes had some fights. There is a famous Alamosaurus specimen with T-Rex teeth embedded in its neck, which at least indicates that T-Rex would feed on it. T-Rex might eat the dead body of Alamosaurus, or a hungry T-Rex might actively attack this animal. Active predation is a speculation, it is more likely that the T-Rex ate its carcass. Now, let's take a look at this model of Alamosaurus step by step. We are still unsure what the head of Alamosaurus looks like. Even though many specimens have been found, there is no definite understanding of which family they come from. A more widely agreed statement is that it may have a certain blood relationship with the Epistocele cordia, which lived in Mongolia during the late Cretaceous. Epistocele cordia or some other dinosaurs residing in Mongolia, such as Nemegtosaurus, have better preserved heads, so we based on the head type of these dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous when doing restorations. It had a relatively large head, which was larger in proportion to its body than other dinosaurs. Its elongated face was like a horse's, with the eyes at the very top of the head. It possessed a relatively large mouth. Some early restorations would make the mouth look like with cheeks, but now we usually restore it to a large, widely open mouth. Based on the new muscle reconstruction, these muscles were mainly concentrated in the posterior of this dinosaur's face. Since scaly skin tends not to have much elasticity, a scaly animal like this probably wouldn't have soft cheeks. Therefore, we restored it to have a big mouth. There is a beak in the front of its mouth, a long, controversial feature that has been confirmed in the past two years. There are several famous specimens of this. One is a titanosaur with only the teeth found to be perfectly arranged together, indicating that, when it was alive, a structure similar to keratin, which is not easily fossilized, kept them together and preserved. Another is a camerosaurus head with preserved soft tissue-like structures on its teeth. In the past, this structure was thought to be a lip structure, but in recent years, some research has suggested that it is a keratinous structure. Therefore, when we do restoration now, we usually make the foremost of the mouth into a beak. Two years ago, a titanosaur embryo fossil was discovered, clearly showing that this part of the mouth is a beak-like structure. This beak grew a sharp spike in its juvenile stage, which can play the role of the egg tooth, resembling some modern animals. It might use it to break through the eggshell. Next, let's look at its nose. For a long time, the nose of sauropods has been restored to the top of the head because, judging from the skull, it is indeed located on the top of the head, between the two eyes. Previous restorations have restored its nose to this point. At that time, 
Scientists speculated that this dinosaur was too heavy to walk on land and might have been soaked in water all year round, imagining that this dinosaur's body was in the water, with only the top of its head poked above the water. The anatomical structure displayed on the fossil is exactly in line with this imagination. Now, we know that this dinosaur walked on land all year round. Current evidence shows that they did not go into the water very much. Dinosaur footprints on land in various environments show that this type of dinosaur was suitable for traveling long distances and adapted to life on land. Some well-preserved fossils of Camarasaurus show traces of attached nostril cartilage, so we now know for sure that this dinosaur had its nostrils in this location. Its fossilized nostril opening is here, but the living nostril opening is here. This is because such a structure would give it a larger nasal cavity, which may better help such a gigantic animal process the air when breathing. Or, this may give it a keen sense of smell, to detect carnivorous dinosaurs or food. Another possibility is that this position may help it produce sounds, for example, it can use its nasal cavity to resonate. Then, let's take a look at its neck. The restoration of the sauropod's neck has also undergone many changes. When people first discovered this dinosaur, their initial restoration was to make it point vertically upward like this, and they thought the neck might be somewhat soft. In the early restorations, you can see that its neck might be restored to look like a swan, which looked very soft and thin. The reason why it was restored like this is because people then believed this dinosaur's long neck was used to reach taller trees or to poke its head out of the water easily. But later, people found that this neck was not flexible and its articulations were interlocked tightly. So was the case with most sauropods. When the holotype specimen of Mementisaurus hotchuanensis was discovered due to geological changes, the fossil was squeezed and broken into several sections. Still, the breakpoints were all in the middle of the vertebral body. Even with such a large force, its articulations did not loosen. Therefore, scientists determined that the necks of sauropods were not very flexible. Later, more advanced technology showed us that the flexible parts of this dinosaur's neck were at both ends, near the head and the neck, and the middle section was relatively rigid. For late titanosaurs like Alamosaurus, we only became definite and restored an accurate appearance of its neck recently, which was quite thick. For a long time, no well-preserved cervical vertebrae of this dinosaur were unearthed. It was only in recent years that many intact cervical vertebrae fossils were discovered. These fossils show that this titanosaur had a very large neural spine structure like a shark fin on the dorsal side of its cervical vertebrae. This structure allows it to attach a myriad of air sacs and muscles, which explains why it still can be so relaxed to hold such a long and heavy neck. All thanks to the large number of muscles along both sides of the neural spine that pulled the neck. Inside the vertebral body of its cervical spine were numerous cavities. Now we know that its entire neck contained many air sacs. This made its neck look very thick, but in fact, besides its powerful muscles, it also possessed air sacs to reduce the weight of the neck, allowing the dinosaur's neck to be lifted much higher and farther forward than we had imagined in the past. For some time in the past, Scientists speculated that this dinosaur might be unable to raise its neck based on its inflexible neck. Now we know that they can raise their neck very high. Over the years, we have learned that its body cavity is stout, and its limbs also have new restoration compared to the past. Take its scapula as an example. Nowadays, we generally believe that the scapula is slanted upward. In some early restorations, we often see the scapula of sauropods are placed sideways, making the forelimbs of this dinosaur look shorter than the hind limbs. But, we now know that the front and rear ends of the scapula are connected to the muscles that wrap the neck and the back respectively. If the scapula is turned sideways, the muscles attached to the back on this side have nowhere to place. So the scapula now stands up, and the muscles on this side wrap around the back. From this model, we can roughly see the outline. When we reconstructed this dinosaur, we made it look much fatter than the previous dinosaurs. In a period, 
especially in the late 1990s, people used to draw the shoulder blades of this dinosaur to be very prominent, which could show the characteristics of the skeleton. But now we know that in a healthy animal, especially a gigantic, thick-skinned animal like a dinosaur, its shoulder blades would be inconspicuous. Therefore, in this model, the muscles on its neck extend from this part and wrap around the whole shoulder blade, making the shoulder blade and neck integrated. Such strong muscles, with the help of the shoulder blades, could pull the neck up. Alamosaurus had typical forelimbs of sauropod dinosaurs. Its forelimbs had five fingers close together so that they stepped upright on the ground. The restored forelimbs of sauropods nowadays appear to be longer because, in early restorations, people made the forelimb fingers stretch on the ground like a large palm leaf. Now we know that its forefeet stood upright, which made its forelimbs taller. Current evidence shows four of the five digits on its forelimbs lack nails. The thumbs of most sauropods had a claw. Some early studies believed that the thumbs of titanosaurs were degenerated and had no claws because, for a long time, no titanosaur thumb fossils were found. Among sauropods, Diplodocus had a relatively large thumb claw, and Brachiosaurus thumb showed obvious degeneration. Because Brachiosaurus was thought to be closely related to titanosaurs, people believed that early sauropods such as Diplodocus had thumb claws, which gradually became smaller in the Brachiosaurus, and disappeared completely in the titanosaurs. It was not until later in Australia that a fossil with a complete forelimb was unearthed, showing titanosaurs also had well-developed thumb claws. This also indicates that late titanosaurs still had huge and well-developed thumb claws. Therefore, when we restored the Alamosaurus this time, we also gave it such a structure. Its hind limbs possessed five toes, three of which were with claws, and the other two were wrapped in flesh without claws. When walking, these claws would all face sideways, as shown in this model, using the largest inner claw to form a hoof structure to move forward. When its feet were relaxed, the claws might spread out a little. The foot movements of this model are intended to reflect such a feature. The limbs of titanosaurs were straighter than previously thought, especially the hind legs, which allowed them to bear more weight. For a long time in the past, people thought that this dinosaur's legs could not be straightened. However, a later definitive study concluded that the legs of this dinosaur could be straightened, allowing it to directly bear the torso's weight vertically. Resembling many sauropods, Alamosaurus had a long tail, but its tail was not as flexible as earlier dinosaurs. Its tail moved along a relatively large arc. Each bone in the middle of Alamosaurus' tail was very long. This is also a critical feature of this dinosaur, which makes its tail as inflexible as early dinosaurs like Diplodocus. Then, let's look at its skin. Many skin fossils of titanosaurs have been found. Although incomplete, these skins show that this type of dinosaur had relatively large scales. These rather large scales would appear very small on such a gigantic dinosaur. However, they were much larger than the typical several millimeter sized scales of hadrosaurs, which could reach one or two centimeters, usually about one centimeter. This relatively large hexagonal or polygonal scale was distributed all over the body. We don't know if there are any notable changes in other parts, there is no evidence yet, but these scales would be mixed with larger scales. Then, a unique feature is that a row of somewhat long and large scales like bricks might grow along the middle of its spine. This was not found in Alamosaurus. A juvenile Saltosaurus has been unearthed in South America. Its back shows a row of broad scales along its spine, which looks a bit like a zipper from a top-down view. We don't know if Alamosaurus has this feature, but we still made it. One of the most eye-catching features of its skin, which is also a significant discovery in recent years, is that there were huge armor plates along both sides of its spine. Very large osteoderms, thick and tough plates like spikes, have been found on Alamosaurus. But how these plates were actually arranged, we don't know yet. People once discovered a titanosaur with armor plates scattered along both sides of its spine, one on the left and one on the right, with the spine in the middle. Therefore, 
We know those armor plates grew along both sides of the spine, but we are unclear how far apart the two rows of plates were, how dense they were, and how far they were from the spine when alive. During the restoration, I built the skeleton first and found that two sets of grooves are exactly located between both sides of the neural spines and the ribs. This is consistent with the shape of its bony plates. Therefore, I think their most reasonable location is against the sides of the spine. The armor plates on some titanosaurs show the spikes were not conical, but in the shape of slippers, the front part of which was a bugled spike with a long section following behind. Therefore, scientists now generally speculate that these two spikes may be far apart, unlike those spikes of Ankylosaurus arranged one next to another. We adopted this appearance, restored the two rows of spikes far apart, and made a long strip piece connected to the rear of each spike. This statement is also controversial. Another possibility is that, resembling a crocodile, its armor plates may be placed next to each other like roof tiles and can slide inside the body. This superimposed relationship cannot be seen on the surface, but we still adopt this more intuitive restoration manner at present. On the sides of its skin, like some other titanosaurs, besides these large armor plates, there may be some large scales sandwiched between them. Good, the above concludes our introduction to Samuel the Alamosaurus.